They're here. La 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 la. Welcome, huge movie fanatic Nate, stopping on by. This time I'm coming at you to review a movie that became relatively popular, spawned two sequels, and I'm pretty sure there's a remake. I've actually got the remake, but I haven't seen the remake. Maybe I shall watch and review the remake, and at any rate, I'm coming at you to review the original from 1982, I want to say. Steven Spielberg production of a Toby Hooper film, Poltergeist. La la la, la la la. La, 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 la. So my history with this movie goes back to probably when I was 11 or 12 years old. I want to say, I'm not 100% sure, I know this is how it worked for the Nightmare on Elm Street films, but it's, I have this recollection that Poltergeist 1 and 2 were on TV back to back, and I taped them off TV, whether they were back to back or not. I, you know, when I was 11 or 12, I taped Poltergeist 1 and 2 off of uh, TV, never having seen them before. If For those of you who don't know, you know, the age when I was like 11 or 12 was when I started to get into horror movies. I was a little too squeamish before then, and by the time I hit 11 and 12, I was like, you know what? I'm old enough. I want to watch these horror movies. And that was when I began my lifelong passion of, you know, just getting into horror movies, and now, you know, all these years later, continuing to just enjoy and discover new horror movies as life goes on. But The Poltergeist has never been a movie that I really, you know, unlike so many movies like, you know, Friday the 13th franchise or even Nightmare on Elm Street, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Halloween films, Poltergeist, I mean, I guess it's not because it's like, I think it's PG. So is this before PG-13? Very possibly. But it's PG, so I mean, I don't know, I mean, I guess it's like a PG horror film, but Poltergeist has never been a franchise or anything that I've really been ridiculously interested in. I got the, I never had it on VHS, I did years ago get the DVD for like three dollars clearance and I just recently picked up a Blu-ray digibook thing clearance um, and, and you know that's my second version I have on home video and that that's the whole reason I revisited the franchise or at least at this point one through three. I'm pretty sure, you know, because I'm doing these, I might as well watch the remake and review that as well. So, Poltergeist, I mean, what what can I say? And by the way, the Blu-ray looks absolutely fantastic. And this, this, as I said, this is a Steven Spielberg production directed by Toby Hooper. And I, I bet, I, you know, I can't even imagine how Toby Hooper got this gig, but I imagine he was probably, him and his agent and anyone that, you know, around him, family, friends, whatever, we're probably really, really excited about him, you know, directing a Steven Spielberg executive produced film. But what, what happens, you know, you're pretty much just saying action and cut more or less for, you know, Steven Spielberg's out making E.T. and you're just saying action and cut and Spielberg kind of, I would imagine just based on the way the movie plays, this, this film, Poltergeist, that he probably has, he probably had tight reins on the film because it doesn't really play necessarily like a Toby Hooper movie and I even... In some video with Matt long, long ago, years past, I even joked that um, the Jerry Goldsmith music in this movie, at the very beginning anyway, when the, the guy's like, you know, when it's introducing the suburbia and stuff like that, the Jerry Goldsmith music actually sounds like John Williams here and there. But um, it should be said that John, um, Jerry Goldsmith, the absolute the maestro Jerry Goldsmith, does the score for this movie, and it's it's one of the most beautiful and amazing, like, themes, you know, and I... I, I, I I put your ears through it with my own Nate, huge movie fanatic Nate rendition, at, you know, throughout the course of this, to, to open this review, and um, if you're still listening, if that didn't make you click away, that is uh, the theme, as you all probably know, but the theme, I mean, let's face it, I'm a big Jerry Goldsmith fan, but the theme, you know, that I've always kind of thought it was like more or less Carol Ann's theme, is just unbelievably amazing. So if you don't know, and you probably do, this movie just surrounds, is, is just all about, and, and just like with E.T., and, and I can't remember if there's really anything else going on, right? Or if he just delves into suburbia and any other movie. Did he did he produce the Burbs? I can't remember who did the Burbs, but um, right around this time, it's the same year as E.T., you know, Spielberg was all into, well, was Close Encounters considered a, a suburban film? Possibly. 
But uh, Spielberg in his early years was known for like, you know, doing this, a lot of this, like, just portrayal of suburbia and stuff. And it's so funny that 1982, he did it heavily in his own film, E.T., and his executive produced film, Poltergeist, the same way. Kind of like almost a, an, a brochure for suburban life, if you will. And uh, in this case, it's like some California town, new town, like, it, I think it's phase, I don't know what the hell phase they're living in, two or, or are they in phase one? I don't know if they're, they're currently starting phase four. So it's basically um, this California town, Queste, Queste Verde, I want to say something like that. This, this family of, is it Craig T. Nelson? It very well might be, go on to play coach in this uh, popular sitcom coach. I actually really like the guy as a performer. Craig T. Nelson is, is fun. And, and, and actually, the, the thing I like probably most about this movie, very much like with the original um, April Fool's Day, is the, my favorite part about this whole movie is just the, the characters and the performers, actors and actresses, they get to fill the roles and the, the writing of the stuff. And honestly, I'd, I'd be perfectly happy with just a, uh, just a PG-rated comedy family film of of this family just, you know, for 90 minutes or whatever, just their their life and, you know, Cueste Verde or whatever the hell this place is called, California, New California suburbs and, and just their trials and tribulations, kind of like a seventh heaven film, if you will, of just what the family is going through, you know, minus the poltergeist shit. I've, I've said this in a lot of other, maybe I said that about April Fool's Day, I can't remember, but in my opinion, this movie would almost be better without the, the horror elements but uh very famously i love how the movie opens with like back in the for those of you for you for those of you youngins uh who aren't aware of this that back in the old days obviously in the 80s and the decades that preceded it they'd actually wouldn't have you know on just broadcast television they wouldn't have tv all night or just completely non-stop running non-stop they'd actually i don't know i don't know if it was midnight or 1 a.m or 2 a.m or i don't know when the hell they'd actually sign off but this is what they used to do, and you know, if you were a teenager, it'd be interesting to see how they handled this in the remake. But if you're a teenager and you're watching this, and you're like, "What the hell's with the like national anthem?" and then it just goes to fuzz or whatever, uh, that's what that's what it used to be like, and it was just crazy. And, and um, I really love how the movie begins with the the national anthem on the TV, and it goes off, and the the you know supernatural stuff that goes on. Um, I, I kind of think that the best part of this movie is actually the mystery of the, the slow build of, of introducing stuff and like, you know, what's slowly going on in the TV stuff. Because it seems like the TV stuff was just at the first part of the film and once stuff starts, you know, really hitting the fan that the, the TV is no longer an aspect of the movie. But the TV, you know, the, the TV and the, the white noise on the TV plays an important part for the first, you know, whatever... I don't know what, 15, 20 minutes of this film where it happens a couple times with this national anthem and white noise and then things happen. But I, I do have to say that uh, I guess probably Spielberg's producerialness and his, his whatever eyes on this uh, project, project. And I mean, let's not, you know, shortchange Toby Hooper. I mean, made one of the most amazing American, North American horror films ever, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Also, just the, the writing is is pretty pretty good in this movie and uh the i can't stress enough how amazing jerry goldsmith's music plays a part in the eeriness of the because i can just hear the, the you know like early on in the film just some of the cues of jerry goldsmith cues and just you know to accentuate this paranormal supernatural aspect of this film but to make a long story not so long or a, you know a long review not so long what ends up happening is they, they st the family starts becoming aware of all this kind of creepy paranormal stuff going on. And the, the daughter, played by Heather O'Rourke, the, the blonde daughter, seems to be more in tune with, you know, what's going on. And early on in the film when she's talking to the TV and, like, I don't know, yes, yes, I don't know. I mean, that's really kind of creepy stuff going on. And that, that's, like I say, I think the, the, for my money... The best part of this movie is probably the first 30 minutes or something like that. I, I, I do, I, I am of the opinion that this movie kind of is a little too long, and I, I'll get into that very quickly here with one of my problems with the movie, but 
Yeah, I think the movie's strength is just the, the cast. The cast and the characters and obviously the writing and the music and it is photographed and cut in a really, really great way. And I, I just think that the as I already said, the the lead up to stuff is more interesting than maybe like when stuff really starts going to hell and, and also the really cool detail about like the tree outside the kid's window and all the spooky toys and the clown doll and stuff like that in the kid's bedroom and it's so cool to see 1982 like the kids of course got Star Wars posters and I think he's got one of those Vader Vader helmet mask things that's an action figure holder or whatever the hell it is my my cousin one of my cousins who had a kind of a well-off parents or dad or whatever actually had close to if not every single Star Wars toy in the 80s very close to it and uh, I'd, I'd often go over to their place and, and look and just oogle at I'm pretty sure he had like the Ewok village place. I mean, he had like everything. A Imperial Walker. I used to borrow the Imperial Walker a couple times and, and returned it and whatever. But uh, I don't know what the hell I'm saying. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm just commenting on the early '80s Star Wars toys and posters and stuff that are featured in this film. But yeah, for my money, the first 30, 40, you know, 45 minutes probably the most interesting about this movie and just as things go on and get more crazy and stuff. Oh, another detail that's really interesting and I don't know why they did this. I mean, I guess granted it happens, but it's kind of interesting that they did it in a Spielberg movie. But if you look at, you know, the, the characters of, of the, the, the age of the, the, mob, the mom in this movie is actually said and it's kind of like, God, you know, she's got like a 17, 16 or 17 year old daughter and the woman is what the hell is she, 29 or something like that? And it's just like, okay, we'll just throw that out there and see if you, if that registers. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it happens or whatever. A young couple will start a family at a young age or whatever. But that's just a detail that kind of, like, it tests if you're listening or not. It's just like, uh, I, I do think the, the the mom is maybe, yeah, I, I, she, she even seems younger than 29 in the movie, more like 25. But, uh, yeah, I, I, you know... Be, you know, obviously when I was a kid, my favorite stuff probably was the end and, you know, the body, the corpses in the pool and stuff like that. But as in, you know, getting on in years and being an adult, my favorite, you know, sections of this movie is the non-horror, non, you know, just the ease, just the, the non, non-terror, the non-peril aspect of this film and just simply the family goings on and, and stuff like that. But... I, I would imagine this the the mom is a stay at home mom and at some point they be you know with the very cool re reveal of like the chairs you know after breakfast yeah I thought that you know that they, she's she's home and she's with Carol Ann and I think they got a dog and uh, the chairs are all away from the table and she's like I thought I told you to put these chairs in she puts them in and then pan over to something and pan back and the chairs are like stacked on top of the table and still I have no idea. I mean, they do it all in one cut, so it's kind of like they, they must have had just pre-assembled, like, screwed-together chairs, probably, that they just were able to just, all in one piece, just put on the table very quickly or something. But, like I say, the, the, the early aspects of the film are, are, you know, looking at it now through these adult eyes... <laughs> are the, you know, the, my favorite element of the movie. And then after that, cut to, you know, Dad coming home, and at this point they drew a circle on the ground and some arrows, and they've been just, you know, putting stuff on the ground and having it poltergeist to the other side of the kitchen and this and that. And obviously at that point the the father becomes aware of what's going on and calling the whatever, the the paranormal researchers and stuff. But one one of my problems with this movie is and it, it, it's it's both a problem and kind of a like way to go that's kind of unique um is the structure of this movie is is very weird to me uh every time i watch it it always plays weird and i mean kudos i guess to the writer for doing something different but i guess i don't know and it's not like i'm a proponent for like abc begin beginning middle end filmmaking or storytelling but it's almost like, I don't know what it is about this movie that rubs me the wrong way. It's almost like, it's weird how it seems like, you know, it, I'm sure you've seen the movie, so you know that Carol Ann gets, like, abducted by the, you know, paranormal entity or whatever. It just, it just seems like that happens, that it's like, too soon, and I don't know. It, there's something about it, this movie, this structure, and having revisited it again recently, that, that's never sat well with me. And it, it's it's all the more so at the towards the very end when when they get Carol Ann back and of course with that 
that woman, you know, the, the short woman who's like the, the clairvoyant or whatever, uh, she's in all three of the films. I, I gotta tell you, I mean, the, the, her delivery of lines just make like any line just sound amazing. I, I, I hope they put her on TV in the 80s as a saleswoman because it's like, if she says anything in this movie, you just, you know, she just, you just believe it. I'm talking about the short, uh, I'm pretty sure she's got glasses. I can't remember her character name or anything like that. But, the, you know, the famous short woman from the Poltergeist films. It's like any line she delivers, she delivers it with such, like, drama. I mean, in a, in a good way, that it's like you just believe it. Like, she could, they could have put her on TV or on the news and said, All right this is going down now and you just be like well she's so convinced you know anything she says she must be true because she's so convincing but i gotta say that she definitely and i think a lot of people would agree when she shows up i mean she really kind of steals the movie i think it's fair to say but you know the paranormal people couldn't really figure stuff out and i think they call her in or something but she she's definitely a show stealer and it's funny because I'm not sure I've, well, of course I was young at the time, but I, I can't remember really ever seeing that woman in anything else. I would imagine she had been in stuff. I don't know the history with that woman in her acting career or whatever, but all I can remember seeing her in is the, the three Poltergeist films from the 80s. But my hat's off to the casting of her. She, she's just, an, you know, once she shows up, she's really a show stealer. And... I gotta tell you, you know, Spielberg in the in the you know '70s and the early '80s could really get away with the gore. Uh, for some reason, they he could get away with the gore, like that one scene where the the paranormal guy is getting, you know, he looks at himself in the mirror. He's like, this guy is always eating. I don't know why he's always eating, but you know, he's eating and he goes into the, I don't know, he feels something and he goes into some washroom and he's with a mirror and he starts peeling his face off and you see this really white sink where all the you know the red entrails, no well not entrails, but gory pieces of his face are falling onto the white sink and it's just like he's peeling his face off and stuff. I mean, this is PG, you know, and I think granted it's before PG-13 became a thing, but geez, Jiminy, you know, the stuff that he got away with in Jaws and now ripping your face off and Poltergeist, I feel bad for like families that brought their kids, you know, maybe younger kids to these movies and they were just completely traumatized by that stuff, but yeah, the structure of this movie has never, you know, sat 100% well. It really worked with me. And my biggest complaint, as I was getting to earlier, is just like when, when, when they get actually Carol Ann back, and it feels like, and I think even the, 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 you know, the shorter woman, the clairvoyant woman with the glasses is like, it's clear, you know, or something like that. Like, the, you know, the, the, the spirits are gone or whatever. And then, you know, the movie just keeps going on, and it's like, okay, well, if it's if everything's fine, why is the movie going on? And, I, you know, I, it, I, every time I watch it, which isn't that often, I just, I guess, it, you know, when I get Carol Ann back and everything, it felt so much like the end that I just, I don't know, it, it just, the movie for me feels like it just wears out its welcome. And like I say, I mean, technically it's kind of like a, you know, a unique way to do it, but it's just, I don't know, it just feels... By then, I guess, I've gone, you know, the, I, I, me as a viewer has gone through so much ups and downs and stress over missing Carolina and having her back that when it when, you, when they got her back and it seems over, I just would have almost assumed, assumed it'd be over. But, you know, it's not over and, you know, you got, when it, it, and I guess it kind of makes it even worse when, you know, it's not over and things start going, you know, to hell. And it's like, oh no, it's not over or whatever, and they go through all the crap of whatever and this and that happening. And one thing that I thought, and I, you know, I'm all over the place with this review, but one thing I thought was cool, I was kind of starting to talk about earlier, is you know my favorite part of this movie, which is like the first 30 or 45 minutes, and in in you know somewhere in there is like the whole idea of the approaching thunderstorm and the dad telling his son how to okay count from the lightning to the the thunder and if you're getting farther near you know you, you don't know the movie and if you don't know the movie watch the movie but i thought that aspect was really cool and then later on of course in another scene he's counting and it's like getting closer and closer and the whole scary scene with the tree and the kid and stuff and you know that stuff's cool the clown thing is cool it very much reminds you of toby hooper's fun house a little bit it's like kind of like with the scene and the clown and covering up the clown and the clown's gone and it's under the you know it looks under the bed on top of the bed blah 
But uh, yeah, I'm all over the place, obviously, in this review. But yeah, um, obviously, what's revealed is that. Uh, well, you know what? Hell with it. I'll, I'll make. I think this review's already probably too long. If you haven't seen the movie, I don't want to spoil. But there's a reason for for those of you who you know by chance haven't seen this film. There's a reason that there's a high amount of paranormal activity going on on this location, and it's really kind of fun how it's revealed, and it's fun to see Craig T. Nelson, you know, his reaction to his boss when he finds out, you know, what's what what's going on, or the reasons for the paranormal, you know, the high amount of paranormal activity taking place in, you know, in his house, in the neighborhood. Well, it's not really going on in the neighborhood. I can't remember if they say why it's focused on the house or whatever, but it's really kind of cool how the whole house ends up getting, you know, um, sucked into this whatever and the whole house is gone, as we'll talk about in the, uh, the sequel review, is kind of a have a hard time, you know, getting a payout or coverage from the house insurance company when the house is completely gone, which is funny, but yeah, my star rating for Poltergeist, even though it doesn't necessarily agree with me all that much, and, and I gotta tell you, the, the amount of Spielbergian, like, drama and stuff that, that takes place maybe midway through when the Carol Ann's lost and and they're talking to her and, you know, tears running down the mother's face and all this kind of stuff and Jerry Goldsmith music swelling and all that kind of stuff. It's like some of the most, like, dramatic, you know, good or bad, it's, it's anyone's interpretation, Spielbergian, like, drama, even more so than in a lot of his movies. It's, it's like, really, really, and I guess it because it, it has to do with, like, this missing young girl and, and the mom scene, it, it really tears at the heartstrings, you know, like when they're talking to her, you know, uh, you know, coming from wherever the ceiling or just the air or whatever, and, you know, everyone's crying, the son, the, you know, I think dad, isn't he off in a corner drunk or something, but, and, you know, even the, even like the paranormal people they have in the house and stuff, so there's a, there's a lot of scenes that really tear at the heartstrings in this movie. I think what I was getting at is trying to figure out my star rating. Even though the movie doesn't necessarily 100% agree with me, I can recognize that uh, there's a lot of greatness in this movie, so I can go as high as three stars out of four stars for Poltergeist, I guess we should say the original from 1982, I want to say. I really enjoyed it towards the end when all of the, you know, well, I guess this kind of gives a little bit away, but I'm sure everyone's pretty much seen this. The coffins are coming out of the floor and opening up and like, eh, you know, that kind of stuff. That's that's what I was watching the movie for when I was 11 or 12, that kind of stuff, you know, just the, the bodies in the pool, newly dug pool and, and this kind of stuff or the, the fun things I thought were, the things I thought were fun when I was a kid and now it's the kind of stuff I'm like, eh, it's cool, but it's not that amazing. But it, 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 you gotta love how the movie ends by, um, well, I guess I can fuck it. I'll just I'll just say it just by going to the hotel and and putting the TV out on the balcony and slamming the door. What a perfect ending! So yeah, three stars out of four stars for Poltergeist. It's a movie that maybe I'll watch a little more now that I got the Blu-ray. Give it another watch, maybe. I'm not gonna. Don't worry. I'm not gonna come back and review it again. But I do have to watch the remake to review that. But yeah, uh, this review went on a little longer than intended. I was all over the place, but you know, if you're not familiar with this channel, that's pretty much how it goes here. Unscripted, on the fly, on the cuff. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks so much for watching, and as always, we'll catch you on the next video.